Now that we reviewed the basics of deep networks, we want to turn to discuss how we can harness their power in the context of wireless communications and see how they can help us solve difficult problems in the context of 5G and beyond networks. Let's begin by considering why we may need machine learning in the context of communications. In general, we know that when treating various design problems in communication systems, we often end up with complicated optimization problems, which can include many design variables, they may be non-convex or even untractable, and often depend on system parameters that might not be known. For example, one of the fundamental problems in the physical layer is designing an optimal receiver to detect and decode transmitted symbols. This often leads to combinatorial optimization problems and also requires knowledge of the physical channel. Now, the channel is often estimated in advance, for example, using pilot symbols, but this necessitates additional bandwidth and capacity. It requires time and it assumes that the channel doesn't vary too quickly, which is not always practical, for example, in a multi-user environment with rapidly changing channels. In this case, estimating the channel repeatedly between all users is not going to be very practical and is going to consume too many channel resources. Another good example is multiple antenna systems, where there are many design issues related to beamforming in both the transmitter and the receiver sides, which again lead to various combinatorial problems, especially when we consider antenna selection methods, and they again will require knowledge of the channel statistics. Security and coding issues are another area where optimization is necessary and often quite complicated. On higher levels of the communication system, we again tend to end up with various optimization problems, which will involve multiple users, often discrete variables, and require knowledge of many system parameters that are not often known, such as channel gains, number of active users, user codes, timing constraints, and many more parameters. To get a better sense of where machine learning can help in communication and why it is needed, let's take a closer look at one of the most basic operations of a communication system, which is symbol detection. So in a standard detection problem, we're going to have a transmitter that wants to transmit messages or symbols to a receiver over a given channel. In our case, illustrated over here, a MIMO channel. Now the transmitter is going to do that by sending a signal S, which we're going to obtain as an output Y. In order to recover S from Y, we're going to rely on a model that describes the relationship between Y and S, where the most popular model is the linear Gaussian model, in which the received signal is assumed to be a linear combination of the transmitted symbols over a block plus a Gaussian noise. Now this model is used really due to its simplicity. Under this model, there are very many well-known receivers that are optimal for different criteria. For example, we could design a detector that maximizes the likelihood of the received output Y. However, in practice, the channel may not be linear, the noise may not be Gaussian, and most importantly, the channel is often not even known, and as we alluded to already, estimating it repeatedly is going to consume too many channel resources. So this seems to be a good problem to examine and ask whether using the tools of machine learning, we can avoid knowing the channel and having to model it exactly. In general, we know that machine learning provides methods that do not require not knowing the exact model. So this seems like a very relevant area in which to apply machine learning tools. So how would we do that? Well, a straightforward idea is to just take this current receiver and replace it by a deep network that uses end-to-end -end training to perform the detection. However, the difficulty is that the advantages of machine learning typically come into play when we have very large training sets, which will not typically be the case in a communication environment that is rapidly changing. In such a setting, it will be impractical to collect large training sets every time the channel changes. Furthermore, as we know, in general, although machine learning methods can work very well, very little is known about their optimality properties and the quality of the solutions from a statistical perspective. On the other hand, standard communication theory provides us with methods that are optimal under various criteria and for which we can analyze the properties of the solution in a convenient manner. So this raises the interesting question of whether instead of using black box machine learning solutions that were not designed specifically for communication problems, 
we can combine machine learning and communication in a way that preserves some of the desirable properties of the standard communication solutions. In other words, what we'd really like is to develop learning methods that rely on well understood models of communication systems rather than generic solutions. In contrast to deep networks, signal processing and communication are in general based on physical models. This allows us to easily incorporate domain knowledge and structure into the methods. It also allows us to perform inference with small data sets and to easily assess the quality of the output. The main drawback, however, of traditional signal processing methods is that they rely on accurate model knowledge that we already spoke about in the context of communication. And in addition, in inference can often be quite slow and difficult to implement. Therefore, the question is whether we can combine the ideas of models with deep learning in order to be able to arrive at compact, interpretable, and simple to train data-driven systems. To see how we can do this, let's take a bird eye view on model-based processing versus deep learning. In a standard model-based method, we usually have some set of measurements y from which we want to infer some unknown x. So in the communication context, y was our received signal and x were the symbols we want to infer. We typically also have a model that relates y and x, and we use that to design an algorithm that determines x by optimizing some metric, which relies on this measurement and the known relationship. So here in this example, the relationship is y equals approximately g of x, and f is going to be a metric that we're going to want to optimize. When we go ahead and try to optimize f, we typically end up with a series of steps that need to be carried out in an iterative fashion. So we typically have some generic mathematical operation, and we then have a set of iterations between a generic computation and some block that depends on the underlying model. And then we typically have some mathematical operation at the end, which will give us the desired outcome x. Now, on the other hand, in deep learning, we do not assume we have a model, but instead, in some sense, we're going to perform magic in the sense that we're going to replace the model by a black box that does not know anything about the problem. Instead, it's going to obtain lots of inputs and outputs that are paired, and from then it's going to learn the parameters of a network in a series of layers that form the desired deep network. Once we get the deep network, we're going to apply this to a new input y and obtain the desired recovery x. So the question is how we could combine these two approaches and to do that, we're going to suggest two different methods. The first is to integrate model-based methods into deep learning by relying on the idea of unfolding that was first suggested by Gregor and Lacoon. The second approach we're going to use is the reverse in some sense. So we're going to integrate deep networks into existing model-based algorithms. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is just briefly describe these two approaches, and then Nir is going to take over and show how both of these approaches are actually used in the context of different communication problems. So let's begin by looking at unfolding, which was first suggested by Gregor and Lacoon, and has gained growing interest in both the signal processing community and the wireless communication community. So the basic idea in unfolding is to take our optimization problem that we talked about before, and instead of just looking at the loop of iterative steps, we're going to explicitly write out several of these steps. So for example, we could explicitly write out 10 iterations. So until now, we didn't do anything new. We're basically just implementing an iterative algorithm. But the learning is going to come into play in the final step, where instead of implementing these iterative steps that are typically going to depend on channel parameters that we don't assume are known, we're now going to use training data to learn the parameters in each of these steps. So in this way, instead of getting a generic deep network, we're going to get a network where we have a small number of layers and the structure of these layers follow from the optimization problem. But instead of plugging in channel parameters that might not be known, we're going to learn them from training data. So this is the general approach behind unfolding that was applied to many different problems in signal and image processing. And we have a recent review where we discussed different applications. It has also become very popular in communication networks, and we refer here to a review specifically for communication, and we'll see a few examples in a couple of slides. 
So this is the first approach we can use in order to use a model-based approach in the context of communication. The second approach we suggest is very different. So it's actually starting from the given solution. So starting from the generic solution that we know is good when we know the channel parameters, and then just taking the block that depends on those unknown parameters and replacing it with a generic deep network. But now this deep network is only, to go, only going to be replacing a specific block, not the end-to-end -end solution. And therefore we still retain the structure of the well-known communication solution, but do not require knowledge of unknown parameters, which are estimated by this deep network. So this again was reviewed in a recent paper that we wrote that reviews this approach, and we're going to be talking a lot about it in the next few slides. So what we're going to do next is see how we can use these two approaches, the unfolding approach and this data-driven hybrid approach, and apply them to various different communication problems. In this part of the tutorial, we will present some applications of deep learning in receiver design. Specifically, we will focus on the problem of symbol detection, where we have a set of channel inputs, which are symbols taken values in some discrete constellation. They go through a channel and the receiver observes its channel output from which it its task is to recover the transmitted symbols, and to that aim, it utilizes deep learning techniques. We will consider three main approaches with concrete examples for deep receiver design. We will begin with the usage of established deep networks for this task. Namely, we're using a conventional neural network architecture in order to classify or to infer symbols from the channel output. As an example, we will show the sliding bidirectional recursive neural network, which was proposed as a symbol detector designed for finite memory channels. Then we will discuss how unfolding can facilitate symbol detection using deep networks. And as an example, we will show DetNet, which was proposed as a symbol detector, unfolding based symbol detector for MIMO channels. Then we will go into data-driven hybrid algorithms advocated earlier, showing several concrete examples, the implementation of the Viterbi algorithm in a data-driven fashion, the implementation of the BCJR algorithm, and DeepSeq, which implements soft interference constellation for MIMO detection. Let us begin with the usage of symbol detection using established networks. So the rationale here is to replace the receiver with a conventional neural network architecture, acknowledging the fact that symbol detection is essentially a classification task. We're trying to recover a block of symbols taking values in this discrete set from a channel output which may take values in continuous set. So the rationale here is to identify what deep architecture is suitable for the considered channel, which deep architecture can carry out symbol detection reliably for the considered case. Once we identify this architecture, we just need to use it as symbol detector and simply train the whole thing in an end-to-end -end manner. And hopefully by showing this deep architecture, a sufficient amount of labeled pairs of channel output and the corresponding symbol, the resulting deep symbol detector should be able to carry out inference reliably. As an example, let us consider a finite memory channel in which the channel output is some function, stochastic function, unknown function of its last set of, let's denote by L, channel inputs. So this is a conventional uh, finite memory channel, though notice here it doesn't have to be linear. In the work of Falsad and Goldsmith from 2018, they proposed to use an architecture which is based on bidirectional recursive neural network. And the rationale here stems from the fact that the maximum posteriori probability detector for such channels actually implements a set of forward recursion and a backward recursion in order to recover its corresponding symbols. Now I will specifically go into those forward recursion and backward recursion later on, 
when we speak about the BCJR algorithm, but let us at this point just say that the implementation of a two-directional recursions, which meet at each specific symbol, allows one to implement the maximum posteriori probability symbol detector, which is a symbol detector which minimizes the error probability. So in light of that knowledge, that's for these kind of channels, the best thing to do is some forward and backward recursions. What Farsad and Goldsmith proposed to do is just to learn those recursion using bidirectional recursion, recursive neural networks. And this essentially exploits the temporal correlation in the observed channel outputs. Now, once, you, once we do that, it allows us to exploit the channel memory without doing it explicitly. We're just utilizing a neural network architecture which is capable of exploiting temporal correlation in time sequences. Uh, in their work, they trained it over multiple channels, only once, but they did use uh, the order of 30 million training samples in order to train this highly parameterized neural network. And what they were able to show is that for some scenarios, they are, the resulting receiver comes quite close to the performance of the maximum likelihood sequence detector. There are several drawbacks of utilizing simple, of utilizing deep conventional architectures for symbol detection. And the, the, the most notable one stems from the fact that we're now having a very highly parameterized network with a very large number of tunable parameters, implying that you need very large training sets. In the end of the day, in the work of Farsad and Goldsmith, they used about 30 million training samples. And we know that communication channels are dynamic. So even if you train it over a set of channels, at some point, the channel may change in time and you may have to retrain the whole thing, which takes considerable amount of time. Also, by using just a conventional, some sort of a black box architecture, we end up with a receiver which is quite non-interpretable. The main advantages of using this approach stems mostly from its model invariance. It does not need to impose a specific relationship between the channel output and the channel input. It does not need to know its parameters. And it has also applicable in very complex setups. For example, in the work of Farsad and Goldsmith, they were able to apply their SBRNN-based symbol detector to very complex channels like molecular communication channels and channels in which the input-output relationship cannot be expressed analytically, but is known to obey a finite memory structure. For the unfolding case, here the rationale is somewhat different. Here, instead of trying to identify what network architecture would do the symbol detection task better, we're trying to identify an iterative optimization algorithm which is suitable for the task of symbol detection under the considered channel model. And then we fix the number of iterations and unfold each iteration into layers just like we have here in this architecture. And once we've done that, we end up with a deep neural network which imitates the operation of the iterative algorithm, and we just train the whole thing in an end-to-end -end manner, again, hopefully, by showing this deep architecture. A sufficient number of labeled samples, namely a pairs of channel outputs and the corresponding symbols, the resulting architecture should be able to carry out this optimization algorithm reliably. Let's see an example. The example we will discuss here is the one from by the work of Samuel Diskin and Wiesel, uh, learning to detect. This architecture is called DetNet, and it's suitable for linear MIMO channels in which the channel output is given by some metrics times the channel input plus noise. Specifically, they consider the case where the channel, where the channel inputs are BPSK symbols and the channel matrix is known. So now that we're already beginning with a case in which we know the model and we know the parameters. Now, the goal here, assuming that the noise is Gaussian and IID, we, can, we know that the uh, maximum likelihood sequence detector is simply the, uh, the one which looks at, which finds the minimum distance uh, symbols. And it boils down to this optimization algorithm in which we're trying to recover the symbol vector which 
after applying the channel to it will be the closest to our observed channel outputs. Unfortunately, when the dimensions of S are large, namely we have a large number of transmit antennas or a large number of transmitters, this, this optimization problem becomes computationally infeasible as the set over which we are carrying out our search grows exponentially with the number, with the dimensionality of this vector S. Therefore, what one could do in order to tackle this problem, which is challenging, especially when the dimensions are large, is to utilize projected gradient descent. Projected gradient descent means that we're looking at this problem here, only the minimization of the distance, and this one can be tackled using gradient descent, which is given just here. Okay, so here we're taking, like at each step, we're taking our current estimate, we're reducing from it the uh, gradient with respect to the symbols times the step size, here eta t is the step size, and this pi here represents the projection because these values of st cannot take any arbitrary values, they have to be in the set of plus minus one, we take discrete values. So this is why we need this projection operator. And by taking the gradient explicitly, we obtain this expression here. And this is exactly the projected gradient descent algorithm for solving this problem here. Now, how do you unfold it? Let us look again at this expression. And as we can see, there's the expression here in blue, which is the conventional gradient descent, and the expression in red, which is the projection. And then we can replace each one of those is a dedicated layer which imitates this approach. So there's the, the, the operation in blue is exactly what we see here. This looks like the uh, each step of gradient descent in which instead of having a step size, we have those parameters delta, which are learned. And we're just taking this operation, which looks like gradient descent, and we're applying some conventional layer of a neural network to it. It's just some affine transformation followed by ReLU activation. So this value here, z of t, is exactly as if we take in our previous estimate and apply gradient descent and some a layer of a neural network to it. And then this projection, which since we're projecting it to, the, to either plus or minus one, but we want to be able to propagate to it. So we're taking some soft approximation of this hard projection, and it can be replaced with a sigmoid function, where a sigmoid resembles the projection into plus minus one, which resembles a sine function. But instead of applying it just to this output, we're also adding another linear layer in here in the middle. So we can look at it as if each one of those pairs is one iteration and consists of two layers of a neural network. One, which is the layer here in blue, which is supposed to imitate the, the gradient descent step. And the layer here in red, supposed to learn to carry out the projection step. And by doing, uh, adding a sufficient number of layers, we're actually obtaining a neural network, a deep neural network, in which the input to the overall network is Y, the observation. The input from a, of each layer to the T layer is this previous estimate of the, the pre previous estimate from the last iteration, and its output is the current estimate. And as we can see, there's like some sort of skip connections because the input was also uh, provided to each one of those layers. And we also need to know the channel, which appears here. And by doing that, well, first we have utilized knowledge of the channel. We end up with a relatively large network. What they have done in uh, their paper, they train it with using about 250 million samples, where the largest channel condition they were tackling is the one if I recall correctly, it had uh, 60 uh, different uh, transmitters, which is a very large channel, very large, very combinatorically different, difficult task. Now, again, we're boiling down to the problem here that we end up with a very large network, a very large number of parameters to train. And although those parameters are inspired by an optimization algorithm, we do need a very large training set to train it, and we are, uh, if the channel starts changing, we need probably to retrain the whole network. Also, specifically here for that net, we actually need to know the channel. We need to know its model and its parameters. So in the end of the day, the main benefit here over conventional algorithms, like actually implementing projected gradient descent, 
is mostly an inference speed. Namely, we don't have to actually carry out our, all those iterations. Doing it over a deep, net, in the deep network is much faster than just doing the iterative process analytically. But on the other hand, we do need to waste a good deal of time and a good deal of computations in training this network. Now let us go to data-driven hybrid algorithms in which the rationale is somewhat different compared to our previous approaches, which just used a deep network, either a conventional architecture or an unfolded one to carry out the complete symbol detection task. Here the rationale is to select a symbol detection algorithm which is suitable for this, for this specific channel and this specific problem and to identify which of its computation requires knowledge of the underlying model. Then we replace those computations with dedicated and relatively compact networks, and we don't train the whole thing in an end-to-end -end manner. We're just training those dedicated components such that we can implement the overall algorithm in a data-driven fashion. As a first example of a data-driven hybrid algorithm, we shall consider the Viterbi algorithm. Viterbi algorithm is one of the main symbol detection algorithms. It's a fundamental tool in digital communication, and it can be considered to implement the maximum likelihood sequence detector for channels obeying this Markovian structure in which the conditional distribution of the channel of the block of channel output, given the block of inputs, can be decomposed into the conditional distribution of each channel output given a set of L previous channel input. So it's exactly a finite memory channel, just like we considered for the sliding bidirectional recursive neural network case. And what Viterbi proposed to do in his algorithm proposed in the late 60 60s is to model each set of symbols which could have led to a single channel output as a state in a state machine, and then essentially do dynamic programming over it, which we will elaborate on next. This obviously works very well. Viterbi ended up founding co-founding Qualcomm. Here is receiving the Medal of Science from George W. Bush. And to understand how this algorithm works, let us do it in a heuristic graphical manner, which captures the essence of the Turby algorithm. So we have a finite memory channel. Namely, we have a channel in which the channel input at each given time only depends on its L channel input, on its L transmitted symbols. And in, in this specific example, we'll consider just memory of size two, namely each channel output depends only on the, on the current channel input and the previous one. And we're essentially building upon the fact that because it's a Markovian conditional distribution, we can factorize the log likelihood as the sum of corresponding log likelihoods. And then what we essentially do is instead of computing this uh, quantity here, we qu compute the quantity on the right using dynamic programming. And what does it look like? Let's say we have this channel output now denoted Y1. Take this channel output and we're computing the log likelihood, the, the negative log likelihood, for each possible symbol combination which could have led to this corresponding channel output. And we're adding this to this graphical form. And here we're computing these costs for each specific uh, combination of channel inputs which could have led to that specific channel output. And then the next thing we do is we update some uh, this path along this resulting diagram, which is what's called the trellis diagram. Then we take the second channel output. We again compute the log likelihood for each possible state which combination which could have led to that. And then again, we're continuing by maintaining those overall paths where we sum the log likelihoods along each path. Again, another channel output comes in. We're again computing the costs. But then at some point, we would start having conflicts. And we would have, we'd start having several paths leading to the same state. And what we do here, we only maintain the minimal path, the path with the minimal loss along it, which essentially boils down to dynamic programming. And once we do that, at some point, we would have a state for a given time instance, only a single state uh, has a legitimate path leading to it. And then we can use this specific state for decoding. Then we can actually know what was the symbol which was transmitted in this case, two time instances after each symbol we're receiving. So this is why it operates in pseudo real time, namely it has some delay, which is dictated by the memory of the channel. And we do this all over again and again. This is actually how it operates. And what we see here is that, well, there are two things that happen. First, due to the, due to the optimal principality principle, 
of dynamic programming, we're actually able to compute the negative log likelihood here to, to minimize it, which means that we're essentially implementing the maximum likelihood sequence detection. And since on each channel input, we're computing the exact same number of, of, of log likelihoods, the complexity only grows linear with the number of, with the block size. And we saw that it operates on pseudo real time, namely there's only a small delay. here. Let us now observe the Viterbi algorithm and take a high level perspective of it and note that the only part of the Viterbi algorithm which requires prior knowledge of the underlying channel, namely the conditional distribution of the channel output given its input, is in the likelihood computation. Once we compute the likelihoods, the rest of Viterbi processing, which in, uh, accounts for the temporal correlation for the finite memory of the channel, is essentially dynamic programming. It's just a set of algebraic manipulations. This allows us to implement Viterbi algorithm in a data-driven manner by simply learning to compute the log likelihood. Here, which is what we call ViterbiNet, we replace the likelihood computation, which are model-based, with learned likelihood computations. And once we do that, assuming that we have an accurate estimate of those likelihoods, we can actually implement Viterbi algorithm in a data-driven fashion by learning only what has to be needed for Viterbi. Now, we note that, for example, if the channel is stationary, then this mapping of the channel input into a set of log likelihood values does not depend on the time index. There's only one function which has to be learned. So how do we learn it? Well, there are actually two different approaches to do that. First is to use classification networks. Namely, we first use a classification network to compute the conditional distribution of the symbols of the channel input given the observed channel output, and then we convert them to the desired quantity, which is the conditional distribution of the output given the set of inputs which could have led to that, where the Markovian structure of the channel is encapsulated. It can be inferred from the previous quantity using Bayes' theorem. Alternatively, we can also use regression networks. Namely, we can assume some given conditional distribution of the input given the set of, uh, of the uh, channel output given the set of channel inputs, which is what we're interested in. We can assume that it is only dictated by its first and second order statistical moments and only estimate them. So how do those architectures look like? Well, for the classification network, let's know that it consists of two components. The first component is this classification network whose input is the channel output and its task is to recover the set of channel inputs, the set of symbols which could have led to this channel output. Now, since it's a classification network, it's trained to minimize the cross entropy loss. It has a softmax output layer. Then essentially what we learn here is the conditional distribution of each possible pair, of each possible combination of channel input, of channel inputs given that channel output. And now let us recall that classification networks are capable of accurately learning the conditional distribution of a cat given an image, which is way more complicated than learning the conditional distribution of a set of constellation symbols given a channel, an observed channel output. So this implies that we can use a relatively compact network here in order to implement this part. However, what we are interested in is not the conditional distribution of the channel inputs given the channel output, but the opposite. So what we can do is use another machine learning tool to learn the marginal per, per, uh, PDF, the marginal probability density function of the channel output. And we can build upon the fact that, for example, we know that the input is discrete. So the marginal distribution of Y has to obey some finite mixture model. And so we can use some sort of kernel density estimation, like a finite mixture model PDF estimator to estimate it reliably using, for example, some expectation of succession algorithm, and then combine those two quantities using base rule to obtain a, a hopefully a param a accurate parametric estimate of the channel output, the conditional distribution of the channel output given each possible combination of channel inputs which could have led to that, which is exactly the quantity we need for Viterbi algorithm. These are the values assigned to each one of those uh, uh, cost values along the trails diagram. Alternatively, we can also use regression networks. Namely here, 
our input to the network is the combination of channel inputs, namely the state. And the output are the estimated first and second order statistical moment of the channel output given those pairs. So this, uh, this does not explicitly estimate the conditional distribution. It estimates the first and second order uh, statistical moments of this conditional distribution. And then once we have these quantities, we can just estimate the conditional distribution as Gaussian. Now, the question is how do you train a regression network to learn the mean and variance of a conditional distribution? Well, there are two approaches to do that. The first is to um, minimize the objective, which can be treated as the negative log likelihood, assuming that it's a Gaussian conditional distribution. So this is exactly the negative log likelihood. It's one possible way to do it. Alternatively, we can just look at this mean value as an MSC estimate of the observation and the, var the covariance matrix as an MSC estimate of the empirical covariance. Here, it's not the covariance, it's the empirical second order statistical moment, but these are two methods using which one can implement a regression network to learn the first and second order statistical moments of the conditional distribution of the channel output given a combination of channel inputs which could have led to that. Now, both approaches which we have discussed, the one uses classification and the one uses regression networks, provide a parametric estimate of the conditional distribution, the channel output given each possible set of channel inputs. Using that, we can implement Viterbi in a data-driven manner. And does it work well? Let us see for this numerical example here. Now, here we are considering a network which is trained with merely 5,000 symbols. Let us recall that the previous examples we discussed were trained using the orders of several millions of training symbols. And what we have here, the curve in blue, is the performance of the Turby algorithm, which knows the channel at each given time instance. And the curve in red is the performance of Viterbinet. And as you can see, it essentially coincides with Viterbi algorithm with, when trained using a very, very small number of training symbols. Now, we can also see that the curve here in purple, this is the SBR and N receiver we discussed earlier, through the trend using the same number of training samples. So as you can see, the performance gap is not that big, but still, our, the Viterbinet algorithm actually approaches the performance of its model bus counterpart since it is designed to do so. Now, another advantage of going into machine learning based methods is that you obtain improved robustness to uncertainty. What do we mean by that? Now, if we implement model-based Viterbi, but we do not know the channel exactly, we have some error, then the performance deteriorates significantly. This is the black curve here. Now, also the SVRNN, if it's trained on a set of channels, each one with slightly different uh, statistical characteristics, meaning that we did not know in advance to exactly which channel we will be tested in during inference, then the performance significantly deteriorates when we're using a relatively small number of training symbols. However, the green curve here, this is Viterbinet trained using the same level of uncertainty, namely over, namely over a variety of different channel conditions. And as we can see, it actually obtains a performance which is very close to as if it was trained using the exact same channel conditions over which it is tested. Namely, by using machine learning tools, embedding it into a symbol detection algorithms, we're able to robustify it. We're not only able to approach its optimal performance, namely we're op approaching a maximum likelihood sequence detection using a relatively small number of training sets, we're also improving robustness to uncertainty. 